like um, like um, like witness testimony. So anyway, that's just a side of a side uh, side story about mitochondrial DNA and the CSI effect. Getting back to our subject, uh, okay. So you have to collect hair at the crime scene. Uh, when we collect hair, we must collect hair standard hairs from the victim or the suspects. Hair where we know it comes from. It, no, we know it comes from the victim. So we'll take the hair that we found at the crime scene and we'll be able to compare it to the victims because we have the victim's hairs and the suspects. Uh, so we'll know how to, we'll hopefully be able to connect the suspect's hair to the crime scene hair. This is, again, not going to be an individual characteristic, but we can, let's say the suspect is blonde and the hair is blonde. Again, we can show some kind of connection. Uh, not perfect, but again, we can, it gives us a little bit more information. Uh, we also uh, have to collect, if we can, other bodily sources for hair uh, to compare it to the hair that we found. For To get the standards, we use at least 25 hairs. That's usually enough um, for the forensic people to analyze and compare between the standard, standard hairs were from known sources to the, to the hairs of the crime scene, where we don't know the source. Often, uh, especially when in crimes where um, traditionally, well, never mind, where let's say women are um, assaulted uh, in this way. Uh, the hair from the um, uh, perpetrator uh, rubs against the hair from the female victim. So what we want to do is first gently comb the female victim's hair uh, to remove the loosely, the, the non-attached foreign hair, and only then do we remove the standard hairs from the victim because we want to differentiate between the hairs that are stuck to the victim, which we know belong to the victim, and the the, the hairs that are just um, like uh, you know, uh, just uh, floating on top of uh, the victim's hair that come from uh, the perpetrator. Uh, let's. Let's move on. Um, the hairs that from the from the from the the standard from the victim or the the victim or the the suspect, ideally should be pulled out so we even have the DNA from we have even the roots. Uh, but um, ouch! So uh, we really it's good enough that we clip them really close to the skin line. We'll get the hairs that way. A part of the autopsy, by the way, is getting the hairs in case we have to analyze the hairs later from the dead body. Okay, that's uh, hair. Um, uh, well, there's also fiber, which is, I mean, kind of looks a little bit like hair. Um, threads that uh, we also try to connect to, uh, let's say, clothing that the that the suspect has and is found at the crime scene. Clothing, again, in violent crimes, clothing can become ripped. And fibers are transferred to the victims if they fight with the, with, uh, the criminal. Uh, also, let's say they, uh, they roll around on the, gr uh, on the carpet and they pick up carpet fibers. Um, uh, they, I don't know, maybe they uh, bang against the bed and uh, the, the bedspread fibers get on them. A lot of possibilities. Uh, oddly enough, uh, or interestingly enough, car accidents. Uh, they hit people and uh, the fiber of the people's clothing is often found embedded in the car surface. So we can find, let's say, a hit and run, we can actually uh, identify the car based on the fibers that are there. As with hair, uh, it's very difficult to find individual characteristics. These are pretty much always class characteristics when we use fiber evidence because fibers are mass-produced. I mean, in the case of the car accident, well, we got we found the fibers of the victim's shirt on this person's car, but then again, um, was that shirt sold only to that victim? Um, uh, maybe 50 shirts were sold to people in the entire neighborhood, and it could have been anyone. So how do you connect uh, the, the... So you can't necessarily connect the, the fibers on the car... Um, to the victim, so that such that the car we know that this car is the one that did it. Maybe this car uh, crashed into somebody else with a, who had the same shirt. So again, it's not that likely, but it, but it, so it's useful. Uh, but it's not individual characteristic. We can't point our finger and say yes, that must have happened. It's still useful as evidence, certainly form of class evidence. Uh, we should know a little bit about fibers. Um, they are natural and manufactured. Natural meaning from the natural, from the like the living world, either from animal sources or plant sources. For whatever reason, most of the time we find fibers. Uh, they are uh, when they're natural. They're animal fibers, which is wool, maybe fur, fur coats that people have. Um, but other times it's um, it's plant. It's, uh, it comes from a plant source. Cotton is the most common. We also have linen. 
that uh, you know some things are made of linen. So, uh, but uh, of the animals, mostly uh, it's um, most of the time it's, it's animal, and of the animals, most of the time it's wool, and uh, if it's plant, most of the time it's cotton. But again, we have all different kinds of fibers that come from what they call natural sources. There are others that are called manufactured fibers. Um, sometimes, I mean, for whatever reason, we take plant cellulose uh, and we actually turn that into a fiber. Uh, it's certainly possible, certainly uh, feasible, and uh, people do it all the time. Uh, these are called regenerated fibers. They are sort of natural because yet you need plant matter first, but we turn that into completely um, non-natural um, fiber that are, that are used, in, um, used in clothing. Or you can get it from a completely non-plant source, just uh, some organic chemicals. You, um, you have, let's say, monomers, organic, uh, organic monomers. Um, by organic, I mean uh, just uh, in the chemistry term form. It's a chemical. It does not come from any living source. Uh, you might have gotten it from, a, from a, um, some petroleum mining. Uh, you might have gotten it from there. Whatever it is, uh, we have some uh, chemicals. We put them together and we'll make a fiber out of it. Uh, like plastic fibers. So all these, by the way, all these manufactured ones, they are all polymers. Uh, we'll explain a little bit about that soon. But the idea is if it's, it can be either from plant cellulose that they change around to make fibers or completely synthetic. And these are called synthetic fibers. So let's look at, I mean, these fibers are, they are um, polymers. Now let's explain what a polymer is. You start off with a monomer, let's say a chemical that is just looks like this. Let's say this is two of the reds and one of the blues. We take, let's say, you know, lots of them, like millions of these little things. We react them together and they join. And they join to form this polymer. So you have the blue and the two reds, blue and two reds, blue and two reds. You form long, long, long chains of like many, many thousands of them, or tens of thousands, uh, depending on, you know, uh, what your procedure is. Uh, this, you know, again, performs a nice, decent fiber. Now, it doesn't have to be the blue and the two reds. You have a blue, a red, uh, three reds, and a purple. Another blue, three reds, and a purple. Since you can have so many different kinds of monomers, you can have many, many different kinds of polymers, each one with a different, with different properties. Uh, some with strength, some with fire uh, retardant uh, capabilities, some uh, whatever is with good colors. A lot of different uh, possibilities there. So um, that's how these synthetic polymer fibers are made. And that's also why they can be highly varied. They can form different shapes uh, naturally by themselves. A lot of different things can be done with, with these synthetic, these synthetic um, fibers. Well, okay, we get the fiber. How do we analyze it? Well, one thing we can hopefully do, I mean, if you take, let's say, a thread um, from uh, the crime scene, and we go to the suspect, and we find another thread in the suspect, and we are somehow able to connect the two. In other words, the fiber was ripped, and we find the exact match to that rip on the suspect. Well, there you go. That's pretty much an individual characteristic. You can you can connect the suspect to the crime scene. That's if you, have, again, this is not very common, where you find, let's say, a ripped fiber, and the ripped fiber's match is found in the suspect. It's Again, it's individual characteristic, but if you can do that, it's great. But uh, usually that's not what connects a suspect to the crime scene. That's not what gives the information. It's usually just we have a thread and we want to know what to do with it. Um, so first thing you got to do is check it under a microscope. I mean, of course, these things are small. We check it and compare. We look for the color. The color tells us something. Now, yeah, a lot of people have blue shirts. But um, that's true. But uh, not every kind of blue.